Uh, I'll now just hand you over to Mike for his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Pat, for that very kind introduction. Hopefully that's going to look great. Okay, uh, it, that was on two before, but it's perhaps better not to have it stereoscopic. So um, I'd, I'd very much like to, to, to thank the Society for the introduction and for the opportunity to talk to you this evening about the work that uh, we're, we're, tr we're doing on, uh, on genetic diversity. Um, and what I'm going to try and do is keep the technicalities to a minimum because I know that not everybody understands DNA technology, but I will be needing to use a few phrases which I hope um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain so you know where we're coming from. And what I'm going to do is um, focus on the issues that we face uh, that were so neatly um, uh, uh, summarised by Pat just now and uh, what we're trying to do about it, how, how our scientists, what, what I'm most frequently asked is, um, it's okay for you to carry on moaning about uh, the loss of biodiversity, but what are you actually doing about it? And I hope to give you a flavor of that, um, and then take you through a couple of examples of projects that I've been involved in um, later. So, fundamentally, what I'm gonna do is talk to you a little bit about biodiversity generally and a little bit about genetic biodiversity and what we mean by that uh, and why it's been the hidden uh, part of biodiversity really over the last um, several decades. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, policy and politics because um, much as though as a, as a, as a card-carrying academic I like to do basic research um, over the last several decades I've had to more and more start talking with and trying to influence um, governments uh, and also uh, other forms of policy makers as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy landscape and this will be of relevance to genetics but, uh, but more widely relevant I hope as well to give you an idea. Then I'm going to talk about two examples just to give you a feel about how genetic information can be used. I'm going to focus on the, um, the white rhinoceros and particularly the northern white rhinoceros uh, which is a species that I've worked on uh, over the past few years. And many years ago, I worked on this um, animal, which I'm sure you will recognise, uh, which is the Scottish wildcat. And I am starting to work on it again, um, and I wanted to give you, and, and really very much from the perspective of engendering some debate about the situation with the Scottish wildcat in this room uh, later on, I'm going to talk about what genetics really is telling us about what you have. Uh, wandering around upon the moors. And then finally, uh, a little bit about how we are trying to get genetics be uh, more um, uh, uh, seriously taken uh, into consideration in conservation planning. Uh, and that is the only way to do that as an academic is actually to sit down with policymakers, with government, uh, government and, and push that through. But that'll be very brief. So, um, this is my opening slide for my final year module in conservation biology. And, and I, I admit that there'll be many people in this room who perhaps study cancer or um, study uh, 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 poverty or, or, or may study um, other aspects of molecular biology who would disagree with me when I say that conservation biology is the most important discipline for an aspiring biologist. But I stand by it. And I stand by it for all of the reasons that Pat mentioned earlier, which is that we're facing an unprecedented situation. Uh, it is our generation um, that has bequeathed an unholy mess to the, the students that we are teaching now uh, in terms of a, a rapidly escalating uh, loss of biodiversity uh, with very uncertain consequences that we know overall will be negative uh, but we really don't know how it's going to play out. And I'm hoping to illustrate that with a few examples later on. Um, but I think conservation biology is an, is an important discipline. It really, in, as, as, a, as a scientific discipline, has its genesis in the late 50s, early 60s, with um, things like the, the book called The Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, who noticed that uh, use of, of biopesticides was having a massive effect on biodiversity. Um, but also, there are some real important points. There was a couple of articles that came out in the Manchester Guardian 
the Sunday um, edition in 1960, late 1962, early 1963, um, that were written by uh, a number of very important people at the time, including Sir Peter Scott, who'd been out to Africa and noticed the first signs of something that we call now deformation, which is the loss of animal diversity. Um, and at the time, it was just a puzzle. It was an, it was an observation that maybe hunting, over, the levels of hunting that have been carried out over the last 100 years since, um, since the uh, uh, European powers um, had the scramble, the so-called scramble for Africa, was having a negative impact on, on, on the species that were there. So it's got its genesis in the 1960s, um, and it has, it went through a lull, I would say, and particularly in the 80s and 90s, but nowadays it's back with a vengeance, and it's an important discipline. There are now degrees in conservation biology, um, and many, many uh, students want to study it um, and get involved in, in the fight that we're facing. Um, and it covers a whole variety of different things, and I, and I teach about whole, everything from animal behavior, through demographics, through modeling of populations, through extinct species like the thylacine, um, unsustainable hunting, um, land conversion for, for agriculture, um, and overlaying that on what we know about the history of biodiversity. So the biodiversity that we are bequeathed um, by the natural environment over time um, has a very long history. Um, in, in Britain, of course, it has a relatively short history because most of the terrestrial biodiversity we have has only reinvaded the British islands over the last 10,000 years. And it's, it, it, it um, has the ice ebbs and flows. Uh, we see uh, uh, different patterns emerging. But biodiversity is not evenly distributed across the planet, um, but we all have a stake in our own biodiversity. Um, genetic diversity is one of three levels of biodiversity. We all know about species, that's what people mostly measure. You can see a species, you can see how many species there are in your national park or whatever. You can also characterise the ecosystem relatively easily, we have ways of doing that, um, you know, we, we have lots of different ways of identifying ecosystem types. The one uh, kind of biodiversity that is not um, observable directly, usually, is uh, genetic diversity. Now, if you look around this room uh, and you look at each other, you, what you're actually looking at is the result of genetic diversity. We all look, diff we all look different, okay? Uh, at different stages in our lives, we all look different, but we all start, start out looking different as well. But genetic diversity, although we understand it, we also understand the fact that you're not allowed to marry your sister for very good reasons. Um, uh, these, these are things which um, are, remain surprisingly hidden. And, Genetic diversity generally has a severe image problem, I think, with the public. And people think about things like Jurassic Park, um, cloning, um, DNA manipulation um, as a universally negative thing, um, which, um, uh, which it isn't. Genetic diversity is the basic uh, raw material for evolution. Without genetic diversity in this room, without genetic diversity across the planet, evolution can't happen. And so if we let every species become a clone, the minute that it is a, a, a pathogen that infects it to which it's susceptible, the entire species goes. That's fundamentally what we're talking about. And so we're looking at the, 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 the genetic diversity that we have in individuals. In other words, the variation you get by inheriting chromosomes from your mum and your dad. We're also looking at, at the population level. And, uh, and we're looking at the, um, how that genetic diversity affects species' ability to respond to environmental changes. They're the fundamental building blocks of inheritance and evolution. And so over the last uh, 40 or 50 years, genetic diversity has really been the, the, the poor cousin of uh, ecosystem diversity and species diversity, not only in science, in scientific terms, but also in policy terms as well. And that is something that we've been trying to address, and I've spent uh, far too long of my career trying to uh, address that as well. So, so that's what we're talking about, genetic diversity. Why is it relevant? Well, aside from the fact that I just mentioned that genetic diversity is the raw building blocks of evolution, we know that populations and species that have high genetic diversity have more options to overcome shocks. 
So when a population, for example, is subjected to a drought or is subjected to some other change, um, we know that populations with high genetic diversity have a higher recovery rate than those that do not. One example that a lot of work has been done on a very important um, ecosystem that we have across uh, the UK is the seagrasses, um, where people can manipulate genetic diversity and then subject uh, those um, populations that they've manipulated to changes, for example, um, acidification, heat, uh, uh, um, uh, changing in temperature, changing in chemistry, and even direct pressure, like, for example, through grazing, we know species with high genetic diversity have got a better resilience, bounce-back ability, okay? And that's because, you know, if we were all the same, and it affected us all the same, then we'd have no options. There's no option value there. The more diversity you have, the more options you have within a species to respond in different ways, and some uh, genetic uh, types will come through. And we know that it's extremely important also in terms of changing the way that we express our genes in terms of proteins and the building blocks of um, organisms to actually overcome the changes that are coming, and particularly climate change. One of the things that, that, that we know is that in the past, when the climate has changed, humans were not in the way of species moving in and out of the, the climate, climate envelope that they uh, preferred. So, for example... If you're a species that pre prefers colder temperature and uh, it gets warmer, you migrate northwards. Uh, and that's what's happened. And, 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 and we know that that's what, what, what has happened um, after the last ice ages, for example. Um, but now we're in the way. We're stopping species from having that flexibility, that plasticity. And so we need to build resilience into the populations they are because they won't be able to move because they're stuck in a national park, they're stuck on a mountain top at the edge of their range, um, or they're stuck in an urban environment where they simply won't have the, the options to change. So genetic diversity is really important if we're going to manage this r rapidly changing environment that, we, um, that, we've, that we've inherited and that we call now the Anthropocene during this, 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 uh, this epoch. We also know that population, most populations of of animals and plants are living in what we call disturbed environments. In other words, they're not living in pristine, uh, their pristine state because almost no pristine popul populations, no pristine areas of the world still exist. Um, and the one thing that we do know, uh, and there have been many studies now that have shown this, is that populations of animals and plants that live in disturbed environments have lower genetic diversity than those who live in undisturbed environments. So whatever we've done, whatever we do, we already know that we're compressing genetic diversity in all life on Earth. And this even goes for what we would call common species. So for example, if you think about a species that's widespread and common across um, the UK, um, it certainly isn't living in the same kinds of populations, connected populations, that it did before man altered the environment. And we'll come back to talk about that, especially within the context of the, of the wildcat. So genetic diversity is important. Our activities are compressing that diversity. And as a result of that, our populations are living in a more stressed um, uh, situation because they don't have as much genetic diversity as their un unstressed cousins to, to react to change. We do have, however, now a set of very well-defined um, uh, obligations under international conventions, one of which is the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, in 2010, we were supposed to have halted the loss of biodiversity, um, but in fact, we failed to do so. And what happened as a result of that was that um, the Convention on Biological Diversity set another round of targets for 2020, one of which was to maintain the genetic diversity of cultivated plants and animals um, uh, domesticated animals, their wild relatives, socioeconomically and culturally valuable species. And they, they talk about uh, something called minimizing genetic erosion. I'll describe genetic erosion in a minute and safeguarding genetic diversity. So we, as a signatory on the Convention on Biological Diversity, have an obligation to maintain genetic diversity uh, in the species that we, for which we have um, governance. And there are all sorts of strategies. Um, the Scottish Government has got a very nice 
biodiversity strategy for 2020, uh, and it's pretty clear um, that, that there are lots of nice aspirational um, uh, activities in place to maintain all levels of biodiversity. We need to be able to measure it, and recently, uh, well, a few years ago now, um, a number of us proposed what we call biodiversity variables or measurements that allow us to um, measure whether or not we're maintaining or losing diversity at the species level, community, ecosystem structure, and genetic composition as well. So we do now have um, a, a set of, 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 of measures in place by which we can actually ask the question, are we succeeding or are we failing? And I don't probably need to ask you uh, the question as to whether we're succeeding in fa or failing. We already know that yet again we are failing. Uh, this is a midterm assessment of the 2020 targets on the Convention on Biological Diversity, and we are failing in virtually all measures. And actually, the governments of the, uh, that, are in, that are signatories to the Convention on Biological Diversity, and that's nearly all governments, one major exception, the United States, um, uh, Cal Surprise, and, and um, basically, uh, we know that almost every level, we're still failing to halt the loss of biodiversity. And it's already being talked about now, well, we need to set a new set of targets for 2030. And we need to ask ourselves the question, how much longer are we going to kick things down the road and say, well, you know, we'll leave it for the next generation to sort this mess out uh, and we'll, we'll postpone our responsibilities for another decade. But that is, you know, not a, not a particularly unusual thing to do. So genetic diversity is important. We're losing it. We've got measurements in place to tell how well we're conserving it, and we know that we are failing. So that, that's the sort of current situation that we're in. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit now about how that actually manifests itself. Um, and I'm going to start off by talking about the rhinoceros, the African rhino. And I want to show you what looks like a rather strange um, diagram here, which is known as a, a phylogenetic tree. It's like a genealogy, and I'll come back to explain it in a minute, but it's basically um, a, 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 a tree of um, inherited DNA sequences that exist, in this case, within the black rhinoceros. The black rhinoceros is a species that's undergone a huge amount of, of uh, hunting since it was first discovered when, um, when people, uh, 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 Europeans went to southern Africa in the late uh, 1700s. And um, if we look at the black rhinoceros today, what we see is this uh, level of genetic diversity and how it's partitioned across Africa. So you can see there are different regions of the genealogy that are found only in West Africa, only in um, uh, Northeast Africa, only in East Africa, and at the top there, in the southern part of the con uh, continent as well. The thing that I want you to look at, though, the only reason that I was showing you this, is that if we look at the, the colour on the branches of the tree, I want you to see that some of them are black and some of them are red. The red ones are all region, all portions of the evolutionary history of the black rhinoceros that are now extinct. And these have been lost only since 1775, because that's how far back we can go with the DNA sequences that we produced. So in um, little more, really, than somewhere in the region of uh, 10 to, to, to 12 generations of, of black rhino, we've managed to um, lose uh, two-thirds of the genetic diversity in that species. Why? The main reason is that almost all of these populations are now extinct. Uh, whereas the black rhino was, used to be present throughout sub-Saharan Africa, it's really only now present in five countries, um, in, in three southern African countries and two East African countries. All other populations have been translocated and all of that genetic diversity that used to exist has gone. Okay, so that's what genetic erosion looks like, the mass extinction of genetic diversity uh, within species. We all know that rhinos are facing a crisis. 
And actually, um, there has been a number of poaching uh, episodes that have really affected um, uh, rhinos across Africa. The last major one was happened in the 1980s, which was really largely precipitated by um, demand for, for uh, rhino horn in the Middle East. The current one has its genesis in the ever-expanding economies of South and Southeast Asia, China and Vietnam especially. And really, um, people only started to notice this poaching ec epidemic um, beginning to start in, in, in 2009. And I'll tell my own story about this in a minute. But for the last um, five years, we have seen a situation where over a thousand rhinos have been poached in South Africa alone. Uh, with, po with poaching happening across um, the continent, um, rhino, horn, uh, gram for gram is more valuable than gold. Um, and, uh, and the reason for that is that people in, uh, who, who use and, 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 and traffic um, these, this material for traditional Asian and Southeast Asian medicine think it's a cure for cancer. Uh, and, of course, there's no evidence for that, uh, and it's a completely inert uh, keratin sub substance. Nevertheless, um, the, 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 the trend is, is, is very negative. I have worked on black rhin wild black rhinos for quite a long time. I was participating back in 2008 in the, the census of the very last known undisturbed uh, black rhino population, uh, in Kunene in Namibia, uh, in this environment. And at that stage, we didn't think that there was a problem. There was no evidence that there was a, a poaching epidemic about to start. Indeed, um, I, we, when we were censusing these animals, there was no evidence that poaching had happened, but we actually found a dead female. Um, and that dead female, although she'd been dehorned, uh, it turned out that the horns were just in a strong box in the local village. Now, those guys are handling, um, you know, something that's probably worth 50, 60,000 US dollars there now, not then, but, but, but now. And, um, and now poaching has come to Namibia, finally come to Namibia. It's the most inaccessible region for poachers. Um, but we have, we, we, and, and so it's caught everybody really by surprise. Uh, and uh, in different parts of Africa, uh, they're having different levels of success. Um, most of the poaching actually was at its most destructive in East Africa in the 1980s. It's much more destructive in Southern Africa uh, at the moment. So, this, for, for a geneticist who wants to understand genetic biodiversity within a species, and in this case I'm going to talk about the, the white rhino, um, the, the sad fact is that I spend most of my time now in museums all over the, all over the, the globe um, because I can't any longer access the genetic material from most of the populations uh, that have existed of these species because they're extinct. Okay? And so we spend a lot of our time digging around museums looking for specimens of different species from different parts of the world. Um, and so that the only way to get genetic samples from the majority of African rhino populations that we know have existed uh, over the last several hundred years is in the museums. And that, and that changes things somewhat. Um, but it allows us to understand the history of these populations. Now, genetic tools uh, have developed hugely uh, over the years. Um, many, many years ago, when before we understood the gene, before we understood DNA, before really the early 1950s and 1960s, we used to use what we call visible polymorphisms. And so if you look at the picture of those snow geese there, you see one white geese, goose, you see one dark goose, and you see one intermediate. But that's actually an example of a single gene, a single variation, that's what we call segregating in the population. The two parents are homozygous, two copies of the white, for the, for the white bird, two copies of the dark for the dark bird, and then the, the offspring is heterozygous. Okay, so you, so you, for, but, but unfortunately, um, there are very few genetic characteristics where it's so easy. Because oftentimes these genes are not so easily, um, you, you get many different intermediate forms, they may not have a simple relationship like this. And there may be many, many genes. 
Darwin figured out, even though Darwin didn't understand anything about genetics, that was Mendel doing that work, um, and they were working in isolation, Darwin figured out that evolution happens mostly by many genes of small effect changing over time. And so these kinds of genes that we're talking about here, which result in very obvious physical differences between individuals in a population, are very rare. As a result of that, we started to look at other kinds of, of variation, including at the chromosomes, variation in ultrastructure of the chromosomes, um, whether or not you have long um, arms of the chromosomes or whether they're absent, the banding pattern of different kinds of DNA on those chromosomes, and then looking at different kinds of DNA molecules directly at the sequence. Okay, so DNA, so for example, in the mitochondria in our cell resides a, a small genome, which is the, the, um, the legacy of the, 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 a time when mitochondria are actually separate prokaryotic organisms that joined uh, with other um, uh, uh, similar organisms to produce eventually eukaryotic cells. And the, the, the legacy of that is that we have small bits of DNA in mitochondrial, uh, um, in mitochondria in the cells, which tell us about um, the mitochondrial history. Now, we all inherit our mitochondria from our mum, and the reason for that is because when, um, when the egg gets fertilised, all the mitochondria from the dads are in the tail, because the mitochondria provide the energy for the tail to beat. And when the tail, when, the, when, when fertilisation happens, the tail drops off. So you just inherit the uh, your mother's mitochondria. So that's a way of understanding the maternal history. But we can also sequence the whole genome, and we're doing that routinely now for many species, and look at all of the variation in the genome. And then there are millions of um, segments of the genome that vary between us. And we can use that information to understand the differences between populations, how they're adapted to their environments, and how much genetic diversity they have for evolution to act upon. And then what we do, largely, is we reconstruct the genealogies that we were just talking about. So basically, we use that information. We take everybody's gene, genotype, as we call it, your, the assembly of all of your genetic variation, and then we can use that to calculate backwards how related every individual is to every other individual. And that will give you not only an idea of how much genetic variation there is in the population, but it will also tell you how that population evolved. And us, as humans, we've undergone a massive expansion, and we can see that expansion in numbers through the shape of the genealogy, who's related to whom. So, by reconstructing genealogies from genetic data, we can tell a lot about the history of populations. And most endangered species have a very different genealogy to humans. They have a genealogy that has large gaps in it where whole families or whole populations have gone extinct. Just like I showed you with the rhino, where if you imagine the picture without the red lineages in it, you'll see a very gappy um, genealogy indeed, and that's because those populations are extinct. So if we were just looking at the existing populations, we'd see a very strange genealogical structure indeed. And that's what we see with endangered species, and that's what we can use to measure the demographic history. So why are we applying the genetics to the rhinos? For a whole number of reasons. So the first thing is that um, there's been a huge amount of confusion as to what we actually have. How many species are there? How many subspecies are there? Where are the limits? Where are the lines between those species and subspecies? Um, and that's because it's based on incomplete data. Africa's a vast continent, um, and many, many populations go unstudied. And on top of that, most of the populations have now gone extinct. Okay? Now, this would be a simple just a very simple academic exercise. So why am I talking about it? And it's the bottom point that I want you to read, which is that effectively, we've got to the state now with rhinos in Africa that we have to start amalgamating populations. And the reason for that is if we don't do that, they're just going to be picked off. And that's what's happening. So unconnected populations across Africa are 
not very well protected in many cases, and the poachers are having a field day, which is why there's so many um, individuals being um, put together. And so in the future, these populations are going to have to be consolidated so they can be more effectively protected and managed to maintain uh, a, a good number of individuals and maintain their genetic diversity. The problem then is that which populations do you put together? Because if you put the wrong ones together, they may mate, but they may not produce offspring because they are genetically too distinct. Or the offspring they do produce will not be very well suited to the environment they live in. So what we're trying to do is draw a genetic map of rhinos across Africa to allow this kind of emergency management to happen so that we can start putting populations in, 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 in environments where they can be um, uh, 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 protected properly and rationally. Because in 1980s, when the, um, the original poaching epidemic happened, that was done mainly on foot by people empl employed um, by, through intermediates by, by, um, uh, uh, to, to, to do very, fairly limited poaching episodes. Now, these groups are, are, are funded and they have uh, helicopters <coughs> and they, ha they are able to come in and come out very quickly. And the poaching is very, very um, uh, sophisticated. So to have a chance in this, in this battle, we need to be able to put everything we can uh, together to protect these remaining populations. So let's go get to the, the nitty gritty then. And I'm going to talk about, first of all, the northern white rhino. And some of you may, may uh, know about this. But this picture I just wanted to show you is really a, a special photo. It's one of only very few photos that have been taken and only ever done once um, where you have two individuals of, the, of, of northern white on the left and southern white on the right in the same photo. So this is a northern white rhino on the left, this is a southern white rhino on the right, um, and these, these have been regarded as separate species for a very long time and have been managed uh, separately. Um, and there's a very sparse fossil record of these animals across the continent. Where the red stars are on the map, that's where the fossils have been um, discovered. Um, and so we know that um, in the last two million years since they evolved, they have been all over the, the, the African continent. And don't forget, at some periods during the last two million years, the Sahara was, was a savanna. It was green during very, very um, uh, wet and, and hot periods. So um, uh, uh, these animals, which live in grasslands, at different times over the last two million years, would have been very different places in Africa, according to the distribution of the grassland at that period of time. So they were all over the, uh, all over the continent. Um, and so now they are separated into the areas. Um, the northern white rhino is found in the area covered in orange, or what used to be found in that area, uh, covered in orange, and the southern white rhino is uh, in the area covered in purple. Um, the southern white rhino almost went extinct. It was hunted almost to extinction, down to a few hundred individuals. But the South Africans and the um, Nib Namibians and Zimbabweans um, understood that, that that population was about to go extinct and have recovered it to the po a point at which now the southern white rhino is the most numerous rhinoceros on the planet with about 20,000 individuals. Um, still being poached at a thousand a year, just to remind you, in South Africa. So it's not by any means safe. But 20,000 individuals. The northern white rhino is in a different situation entirely. Population size of three. No, sorry, two. And the reason it's down to two is because probably, as you know, in March, on March the 20th last year, the last male northern white rhinoceros died. Um, and... Uh, normally, that would be um, a, an obvious trigger to say that species, subspecies, whatever you want to call it, is functionally extinct. Actually, uh, over, the, over the last um, 20, 30 years, when the animals were brought into captivity, they were able to collect um, hundreds of millilitres of sperm. So there is quite a lot of male 
um, genetic material available from the northern white rhino, not only from one individual either. But nevertheless, there are no male northern white rhinos. And the two female northern white rhinos are relatives, and as far as we can tell, they're post-reproductive. So it's a pretty difficult situation, to say the least. Um, and so the, the history from 1895 is very different from these two subspecies, and this is important. I just want to emphasize this. So the southern white rhino was recovered from almost going extinct by actual conservation measures in South Africa, uh, and to the point that, it, that, um, that, uh, that it's in, in, in the tens of thousands. Whereas the, the northern white rhinoceros um, actually had a higher population size in 1960 than the southern white rhino. But it has absolutely plummeted down uh, and to, the, to the situation that we're in today. Um, why is that important? Well, people think that the northern white rhino is a separate species. The sixth rhino, a taxonomic reassessment of the critically endangered northern white rhinoceros. So people have been um, thinking that this is, that this is a, a, a one-way street for a, a separate species that's on its way path to extinction. Um, and, uh, and so what we wanted to do was ask the question uh, with, with using what we call the museum DNA specimens, the ancient DNA specimens, is, was that really the, always the case? Were they genetically distinct? And if so, um, at, at what level? Are they subspecies? Are they species? Um, could they ever be similar to each other enough to be able to rescue, the, for the southern white rhino, to potentially rescue the northern white rhino or replace it? So what we did is we did DNA sequencing, and I'm not going to talk about the, the details too much, except to say that this big, broad, blue line you can see a few small areas of red in each. Each of these uh, lines represents the genetics of an individual. There's one I just want to point out to you, which you may be able to see, called NASI, which is SWR-NWR hybrid. And you can see that that individual, the line, is half red and half blue. Okay? So each individual here in the, north, in, the, in the southern region is nearly all blue. Each individual in the north with the exception of that hybrid, is nearly all red. So they are genetically distinct. Okay? Their mitochondrial DNA that they've inherited from their mother is also genetically distinct. So there's no question that these are two separate, long-separated populations that are genetically distinct. Um, and when we apply what we call a molecular clock, if we understand the rate at which the DNA was analyzing evolves over time, and we multiply that by the generation time, we can estimate how long in the past they diverged from a common ancestor. And in the case of the southern and the northern white rhino, that turns out to be very close to one million years. Okay? So they've been separated from each other for about a million years. And they have been separated from the um, black rhino for about 10 million years. Okay? So this is, a, this is the sort of time scale we're looking at. So yes, this is a distinct um, uh, population. Can they interbreed? Have they ever interbred since they diverged? Can we tell that? What we can do is take the genetic data that we've got and simulate in the computer the genealogies that best explain the genetic data that we have now. So you simulate lots of different things that could have happened in the past. So we know that the populations declined. We know when they declined, because that's recorded. Okay? So we can uh, look at the rate of expansion or decline. So here's an expansion. This is the southern white rhino. We know it's expanded over the last um, hundred years, from almost nothing to uh, tens of thousands. And here is the, the, the northern white rhino that we know has declined over that period of time. So we can start modelling different ways in which that can happen. We can also model whether or not they have been exchanging genes over that time. Because if that is the case, then we can maybe understand how genetically distinct they've um, become and whether or not uh, they, they, they could potentially produce fertile uh, 
offspring between them. So, I don't want you to worry about the numbers too much. There are two things I want to point out. The first thing is, N1 is the, the past population, the ancestral population size. How big the population was in the past. And we've got numbers for both northern and southern that correspond to about between 60 and 100,000. Okay? Um, now, this isn't the number of individuals, this is the number of genomes. So it's probably the case that it was uh, uh, quite a number of, uh, of times greater than that. But you can get the, the impression that in the past, the population size must have been vast. But when the population crashed for the southern white rhino, we can date that to about 250 years ago. And that is a very nice result for us because that's when um, we know that the hunting started um, when Europeans first settled in the uh, southern part of Africa and started hunting the southern white rhino. The thing that surprised us is the, the date at which the decline of the northern white rhino started, which is over a thousand years ago. And that indicates that the best explanation that we have for that is not um, a colonialism effect, but actually the Bantu migration that happened between 1500 and 1000 years ago, where Bantu-speaking people migrated out of the Central African rainforest and into the northern savannas and started colonizing that area, may have hunted them uh, directly, but there was also the Arab slave trade starting at that time as well, when trophies would have been taken as well. So it looks like there's a colonial origin for the most recent bottleneck of the southern white rhino, but a Bantu origin for the bottleneck, the beginning of the bottleneck of the northern white rhino. Um, and so that's, that's the, 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 the key take-home message from this unnecessarily complicated slide. We then looked at the different potential scenarios of mixture. So we know that 20,000 years ago, the habitat in, in yellow is the sort of savanna habitat area, grassland habitat, and its distribution across Africa. We know that distribution from pollen core data. Okay, so we know that 20,000 years ago, there was a, collect a connection, there was a bridge, there was a, a link between the northern range and the southern range. So we tested a whole bunch of different scenarios to see whether or not they were always isolated, whether the south migrated to the north, whether the north migrated to the south, or whether there was bi-directional migration between those populations. And we found a very strong signal for bi-directional um, uh, uh, migration. And the thing that really knocked us sideways from the data was the timing of that because it could have been as recent as 14,000 years ago, at the very um, limit of our estimates. And if that's the case, there's been genetic exchange between the northern white rhino and the southern white rhino, which diverged a million years ago, but there's been recurrent genetic exchange between them really up until um, a, a very recent time in the past. What are the implications of that finding? Well, here they are. We're at the last chance saloon for the northern white rhino. I'm going to pose several questions to you as we go through, and this is going to be one of them. What would you do in this situation? Um, and actually, the, the different sides of the debate can be, can be read in the media. You can go online and you could read all sorts of things. You've got things like, Sudan the rhino is dead, but his sperm could help save the species. And so there's lots of ideas that we can perhaps use, um, gene editing, stem cell science, and um, IVF to resurrect the northern white rhino. Alternatively, Africa's northern white rhino shouldn't be resurrected Jurassic Park style. So why just let um, nature take its course and uh, let, let it go extinct. There's a third way. There is a third way. And our data imply that southern white rhino individuals could potentially, as a, as a means of last resort, be crossed with northern white rhino individuals and they may produce fertile offspring. And if that's the case, there may be a future for a rhino population of some sort to live in the region that the northern white rhino uh, lives in now, um, where, where we would uh, allow hybrid individuals to go into that region and then let natural selection uh, select those individuals with the, with the fittest genotypes.
This is a highly controversial uh, uh, opinion, um, and most of the conservation efforts are going desperately towards the cloning end of the um, argument to maintain the northern white rhino. So I'm just going to leave it there, because we'll talk about it later on. I hope to get your opinions on this. I'm going to talk about this handsome fella uh, for a little while. Um, and this is, this is, of course, emblematic species um, uh, in, for, for uh, Scottish biodiversity. But I'm sure you know that it's in trouble uh, and has been in trouble for a very considerable amount of time. Um, so the question that we are, we've been asking, uh, and we've been asking this question now for um, several decades, I have to say, is whether or not there are any Sco true Scottish wildcats left. It has its own taxonomic status, subspecies status, Felis sylvestris grampia. You probably know that it went extinct in England and Wales by, the, um, uh, by, by about the 1880s. It was um, only found in a small refuge in northwest of Scotland, reached its lowest level by, the, by probably 1914, and it's a terrible thing to say, but may owe its survival to the First World War. And the reason for that is that most of the people that were responsible for its persecution went off to fight in the trenches and didn't come back. It's also coincident with the establishment of the Forestry Commission that it, that it started to, um, uh, uh, to expand. But the big but is it's expanded what we call the Scottish Wildcat. It's expanded at a rate that seems unfeasible given its population size uh, in the be beginning part of the 20th century, uh, and a lot of people have speculated that part of the reason it might have expanded more quickly than expected was through hybridization with domestic cats living on farms or around farms or feral domestic cats um, uh, in, in, in different parts of its range. Under the assumption that it is a pure species or a pure subspecies, it has been fully protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act and the EC Habitats Directive, okay, since 1988. Um, but if it is a hybrid taxon, it falls out with the legislation, okay, so it's not formally protected. So, to what extent, what, what, what do we know? What does the genetics tell us uh, about this animal and, and how it looks? And how does that link to its diversity? Now, you may know that there are some really good, what we call phenotypic, physical characteristics that you can use to describe um, the, Scottish, the classic Scottish wildcat uh, phenotype, although I have to say that that's all based on um, type specimens in museums that were deposited after the arrival of domestic cats, so they could have already been hybrid. The colour of the paws, pale paws, broad skull, broad tail, lack of a, 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 a continuous dorsal stripe down the back of the, 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 the animal, um, and, um, and those are things which set the animal apart. Not just physical size, but conformation. So what we did is we did DNA profiling, the first big study, uh, and we work with a, a very well-known person involved in this field called Andrew Kitchener, who is, works at the um, National Museum of Scotland, who studied these animals, measured their skins uh, for decades. Uh, and then we used DNA profiling. And then we compared the DNA re results with the, the morphological, the phenotypic results, and asked the question, do we get a good correlation with the genotypes of the animals and their phenotypes? And do they, how well does that that work. Now this is a complicated slide, but I just want you to imagine that what we've done is we've taken the genotypes and we've mapped them in space according to how similar they are. So it's like a, a space, a spatial way of mapping the genotype. So if we look on the right hand side of the space, each dot is an animal. And the closer two dots are together, the more similar their genotypes are. Okay, so on the, the right-hand side of this space, we've essentially got house cats, okay, regardless of where they are, whether they're in Scotland or whether they're in uh, England, they're, they're very similar, okay, 
two reasons for that that we expect to see that, and that is firstly, um, they're domesticated, so they're genetically similar anyway. But secondly, they're actually domesticated from a, a, a different species, Felis libica, okay, which is the, the wild cat that lived in North Africa that was probably domesticated in and around Egypt uh, and, those, and, and that region. And then we've got this big cloud of other dots, which is to the left of the zero mark on the, on the spatial map, and that is those cats are wild living cats. I use that term advisedly. Wild living cats. Okay? And they comprise animals which we know are phenotypically, morphologically, pure wild cats. And they comprise hybrids as well. So effectively, if we compress these dots into one line and look at the density of those dots, we can see the house cats has one curve, one peak, which comprises all of the genetic diversity for house cats. Wild living cats, wild caught cats, have two peaks that have one peak which is domestic cats, these are feral moggies, and the other one which is a big cloud of hybrids. Okay. And then when we look at whether or not the the most wild cat type animals are found in one place or one elevation or north of the Great Glen or in, Cal in remnant Caledonian rainforest or any of those things, and we asked that question, unfortunately, with our work, we found that there was no real pattern that we could discern as to whether or not um, a wild cat, true wild cat genotype had a particular geographic affinity. Okay, so they appear to be scattered in our data set anyway. The only thing that we could do is we could do the same genetic profiling that, that, that I described previously with the rhinos, we could do it on the museum cats. And we found that what had been brought in as a wild cat into the museums before the 1950s tended to be purer in its genotype and that what seems to have been happening is that the the animals that we're calling wild cats are having more hybridization as we go into the 60s, 70s, 80s and into the present day. So hybridization is continuing and accelerating. So wild living cats are diverse. There's definitely a signal of an indigenous wild cat population. No question about that. Um, in, in stark contrast to the, the, the house cats, they're highly heterogeneous. And actually, the morphological data, the, the pelage, the patterns on the back, correlate pretty well with the genetics. But we could find very little effect of latitude, longitude, and elevation. And SNA, Scottish Natural Heritage, weren't very happy with that result, because I think what they were hoping is we could say, right, if you just conserve this population here, let's say, you know, Northern Cairngorms, Abernethy, whatever, that, that, that's where you're going to be preserving the biggest amount of wildcatness. In, in our data set, at least, that doesn't seem to be the case. They're, they're spread out. Um, and we can see in the, in the, in the recent museum skins that, that there's, there's a lot of recent hybridization. So the legal status of this animal um, is, 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 is very tenuous, um, and it, which means that, you know, what are the management options? And I'll come back to that now because I want to bring you up to 2018 because where can we go from here? Well... Most recently, and this was just published a few weeks ago, a, a, a much more extens extensive analysis was carried out looking at different genomic regions in the, in the chromosomes of these animals. Uh, and we were hoping that they would find a magic bullet and say, you know, we found a region or we found a particular kind of um, a genotype that is definitely Scottish wildcat. Unfortunately, and I'm just quoting from the paper, we discovered that despite increased genetic resolution provided by these methods, wild living cats in Scotland show a complete genetic continuum or hybrid swarm structure when judged against reference data. So the situation, I'm afraid, hasn't changed. Uh, the results that we produced back in 2001 have been recapitulated now in 2018. So now where do we go from here? Well, at a scientific level, the hunt is on to find the wildcat gene. The only way we can do that is by sequencing the genomes as many wild cats as we can, comparing those with domestic cats, and that's actually ongoing at this moment. In fact, I, 
I'm co-supervising a student and we're awaiting this whole genome sequences of these wild cats that should be delivered within the next week or so. So pretty soon, we'll be able to say whether or not there's any magic bullet within the um, you know, 3 billion uh, DNA sequences that, that, that there are within the genome of these animals. But I, wanna, I don't want to let you off the hook. I want to pose these questions again. I want to reiterate the question. You know, um, it should be noted that very few of these animals have met the Pellage criteria. We recommend that the conservation community in Scotland must now define clearly what measures are to be used to define a wildcat living in the wild in Scotland if future active actions are to be affected. So if you want to keep wildcats in Scotland, they need to be protected. I think everybody agrees with that. How do you want to define them? Hybridisation is accelerating. We showed that with the data. And it's probably too late to stop it. I mean, I've, I've spoken to people in SNH and, for example, said, what if we got all of the farmers in Scotland to neuter and spay their cats? And they've always said, come back to me and say, you can't do that, that's mass medication. That's not a, that's not a possibility. Um, but here's, a, here's an interesting thought, which is that the, the habitat in which the original Scottish wildcat lived doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay? It's living in a highly modified habitat. It doesn't live in Caledonian, rain, uh, Caledonian forest anymore. Okay? Um, maybe a little bit of domestic cat genome helps it to adapt to a modified landscape, which it's living in now. Could that be the case? Could, could a little bit of hybridisation or some hybrid hybridisation actually be beneficial to the wildcat? And are we agonising over something that we can't change anyway? And should that in fact affect or, 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 or um, uh, prevent conservation measures being applied? And if so, how do we do it? I want you to think about that because I, that's something I'd like to discuss with you uh, when we have the questions. The biggest problem we've got with all of this is policy and politics, just like in all of these things right now. Um, so what I've been spending a lot of my time doing is working with policymakers across the European Union. We had a big EU project a few years ago where we, where we basically got all of the policymakers from all of the countries in the EU and we taught them genetics because many of them don't have no idea. They, they come from very different backgrounds. Most of them are not even scientists. So to actually get them to understand the data that I've showed you today is very, very difficult. And then to, for them to make decisions on policy level is even harder. So we've been working with policymakers across the EU, producing knowledge packs, get, getting to understand um, and communicate with the scientists. Because us scientists are also very bad at this. We don't communicate clearly, consistently, and, and um, in ways in which... Um, uh, uh, policymakers can understand. So it's very important that we up our game in doing this, and that's one of the things that we've been trying to do. And recently, um, as Pat mentioned, we've been allowed to form a specialist group of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, which we've been doing. We've been working all over the world, um, uh, uh, and actually I was in South Africa uh, just before Christmas. Um, the South Africans have got this peculiar... Um, habit at the moment of deliberately breeding weird coloured versions of their game. That's a black impala, that's a golden gnu. These animals are fetching ridiculous amounts of money, but they are also um, uh, potentially altering the gene pool of the populations, because everything's fenced off. Um, if you've got a high value animal, this animal may be worth 4 million rand, um, then what you do is you apply uh, herbicides across your entire um, uh, land so you can take out the predators if they try, try to steal your very valuable um, animal. So we've been working with that, we've been, we've been um, uh, 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 providing advice to governments and we continue to do that. And in fact one of the people that's in the, the picture here uh, on the, the bottom right, Helen Sen, uh, is the first author of that wildcat paper. And so she works at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland at, at Edinburgh Zoo. And, and so we are working really hard to get the message across to, um, to, to policy makers. Because in the case, for, for example, of the Scottish wildcat, there needs to be a really mature debate on what, what, what is possible and what we should be doing. 
uh, in the future to make sure that that, that, that that animal doesn't disappear. So it just remains for me to thank my colleagues um, who have produced a lot of the data that I just talked about today. Uh, at the top of the, the, the two pictures at the top, Mark Beaumont and Joe Howard McCoon, they're working with me on the Wildcat project and the, the genomics data. Uh, Yoshin Moodley is a uh, professor at the University of Venda. Issa Rita Russo is a postdoc in my group. Shadrach Moya is a, uh, a, an associate dean at Kenyatta University in Kenya. These guys work with me along with many others listed here on the genetics of the, of the, um, the, the rhinos. Um, collecting this material takes years. Th that study that I described took us a decade um, because it's so hard to do. Um, but they were all very, very helpful in, 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 in making this come to fruition in the end. And we just hope that it's going to have uh, a long-term effect on the conservation of the species. So I thank you for your attention.